Okay, so thank you very much. And thanks to the organizers for inviting me to, uh, to talk here. So, as Jack have said, we, uh, I chose a title called On the Shoulders of Secluded Giants because I liked the, uh, the metaphor. I think the metaphor speaks at many different levels, in fact. Um, on the first level, it speaks um, basically like Isaac Newton used it, but he wasn't the first to use it. In fact, he, it was five centuries earlier that Bernard de, de Chartres actually uh, coined the phrase, we believe, to mean that basically science, knowledge, is incremental and we always build on the works of the past. So I think this is a fantastic uh, metaphor, um, which uh, is illustrated by one of my friends here, where basically by standing as a dwarf on the works of the past, you can see much further into the future. And the reason I ins inserted secluded into the title was precisely because of the problems we discussed yesterday, that in this uh, data-driven age, the problems of sharing those works are becoming more and more uh, great and more and more acute. And uh, unfortunately, if you stand on hidden giants, you're not going to see very far. So we've got to find ways to, uh, to get these giants to stand up again, to get these digital works out there. Now, the other reason I chose it was because it actually expresses a common uh, feeling of how science works. Science is done by giants. Science is done by geniuses. And we tell history just like... Um, just like uh, it was told by Churchill, we tell it by the victors. We just give a, a very simple view of history, and this is what the popular culture is. There are giants, and they make incredible eureka moments. And we tell this again and again in, in today's mediatization. In fact, I was interested, uh, just a couple of days ago, I was watching uh, the, the Theory of Everything um, film about Stephen Hawking's life, and I saw this beautiful scene where he gets stuck in, the, in his jumper and looks out at the, uh, at the embers of the fire and has his eureka moment and w realizes um, how black holes work um, and, and, and how the radiation works just by looking in the fire. And this is what we tell the public all the time. This is the mediatization of science. Um, but in fact, science is much different to that. Science is done by collective action. Um, I've just uh, drawn on here a few of the other actors, but there are literally hundreds of thousands, as we heard from Martin, that are active in the field, in any given field. This was my field that I've just added to the history of the field. And uh, science itself, oh, we seem to have lost a, a point at the bottom there. Science itself is much, much richer than this portrayal. Uh, it's a human enterprise. Um, it's a collective enterprise. So it's a shame that we uh, portray it like that because there's a whole process of science involving all of these people that it's important to bear in mind when we're thinking of what we should be improving. So what is this process of science? So the process of knowledge generation. So if we look in the center there, basically from, from either laws or observations, we, bring, we, we uh, create hypotheses. And these hypotheses um, allow us to make predictable, uh, testable um, uh, predictions which through experimentation we then falsify. So this is a, a circle that goes on and on as, and we've been creating this method of science over the last few hundred years. Um, it's a very dynamic process in which falsification is a very important part. And finally, when you yourself have worked out that uh, it's uh, something that stands, you conclude and you publish. And the publication step allows not only yourself but others to take a look at the same idea, the same hypothesis, the same test and check whether they think it's valid, whether they can reproduce it and replicate it and ultimately to falsify it as well. So this is a very powerful method of science. It's a collective process which unfortunately that popular view of the geniuses seems to ignore because in fact the, the, the story of uh, the reason I said um, uh, Stephen Hawking, it really is nice to, uh, for the cinema to, to portray him as having this eureka moment but actually what happened was he was inspired, we believe, by two uh, Russian papers, um, which gave him an idea. He worked on the maths of those ideas, and he came up with, um, with an answer which he just really didn't like, simply because he'd heard it expressed by an American physicist that he didn't respect. So then he tried whatever he could do to try and falsify what he'd done himself, failed to, and eventually published it, no one else could falsify it, and so that's our theory of black holes. So, science is much richer than the portrayal of geniuses, and we must be, remember that when we're trying to think uh, what we're improving. 
So it's a collective process because brilliant minds can also make mistakes. But what is the key uh, element in here? It's this publication. In publishing, we're not just opening our lab and saying, hey, come and have a look in and see if I did it right. No, we're actually distilling perhaps months of effort into something that we organize, we put a narrative to, and we communicate it. And we communicate sufficient details that someone can completely understand what we've done and therefore validate it. So this publication step is really important because when we think of data, we have to remember that it isn't what we used to do, just open the, the, the lab. We actually did something more in terms of a narrative and a distillation. So in our data-driven age, um, the, the processes of observation and experimentation have become very digital. Digital sensors, data acquisition systems and processing chains, computational modeling. So there's data and software absolutely everywhere. And I've drawn it deliberately right over that because as we've heard in the last uh, few talks uh, yesterday, um, it is breaking this chain. It's breaking the reproducibility, as Martin said, uh, because we aren't able to publish it in the classic sense here. We aren't able to communicate its essence or even communicate it in a manner that other people can base it, um, their investigations on. Now, you might uh, be tempted to think that this is a very uh, recent development. Well, in fact, it's, although I've said it's digital, it's anything to do with data. And uh, I came across recently a, a beautiful example from uh, 1600s, the planetary data. Now, when I was taught this in, si in school, I was taught that this was a fantastic example of what happens when you share your data. But I was in Prague uh, last week, and they told me, the historian there told me a slightly different story. So, Tycho Brahe made the uh, fantastic Mars observational data, but he was utterly convinced in the geoheliocentric system. So he tried to fit and fit his Mars data and couldn't get it to work. He worked for years and years on this and couldn't get it to work. Along came Kepler, a chance meeting apparently, um, said, explained his theories and said, could I get some access to your data? So Brahe gave him a little bit of access and started to fit some things looked hopeful, but then Brahe said, you can't have any more access. So there was an angry uh, dispute, and, uh, and uh, Kepler went away. Apparently, within a few months, he came back, because he was kicked out of grants, because he refused to, uh, to change to Catholicism. So he came back and begged to, uh, to join. Brahe let him uh, join his uh, team as an assistant, and he got more access. And he was able to fit more of his theories, but not enough to actually prove something. Then, mysteriously, <clears throat> the year later, Brahe died. And two days later, um, Kepler was made the imperial mathematician and got full access to the data. He started fitting uh, ovoids instead of this uh, ge geoheliocentric system um, and was getting some good uh, traction, but not particularly good. He made 40 attempts, apparently, you can see from his notebooks, um, before finally he tried an ellipse. Immediately it fit, he concluded, without looking at the rest of the data, so he had the data for Mars, he concluded it fit for all of the different orbits of all the planets, pub and, and was ready to publish it straight away. He wrote up Astronomer Nova um, in 1605, but he didn't publish it for another four years due to, and I think uh, my colleague over there will appreciate this, the IP issue that Ta uh, Tycho's heirs said he wasn't allowed to publish on the data. So these things that we think are today our problems, they're true of data anywhere. There's the human aspect, what happened in 1601? Did he really kill to get the data? Um, and and the, uh, the aspect of the, uh, the IP and the data sharing, which was the key to getting somebody else to, uh, to make the next step forwards. Okay, so. We've heard in the last uh, talks of, uh, of yesterday how open science is such a good idea and in fact is wholly supported by basically the whole community. But it's only very cautiously embraced. And I would say, I think it was um, Daniel that expressed the different levels of, uh, of uh, adoption. And I think most people are just at the compliance stage at the moment. Um, now, why is that? Because uh, I think Julia explained so many of the different uh, drivers that we know are already there. Um, the, uh, the business aspects that uh, Martin was mentioning, the cost effectiveness, the human right aspect of the, uh, the common knowledge, 
the, the public good of science. So we've got all these drivers. Why is it that we're not just getting past the compliance stage? In fact, I'm not going to describe any of those because all my colleagues did it yesterday. Um, but there's one they missed, which was my favorite. Um, another reason why we should do open science, and that's to avoid uh, eternal damnation. So um, this was the uh, Eurosceptic, neuroskeptic uh, blogger that uh, expressed Dante's Inferno, um, the nine levels of hell, for scientific hell. I thought this was brilliant. Because uh, you go through the sins, various different sins like p-value uh, hacking, down through plagiarism, and you eventually end up at the worst uh, levels of sin, which are all data related. You can either um, not publish your data, you can partially publish your data, or you can uh, invent some data. So basically, uh, we should all be uh, doing open science to avoid uh, eternal damnation. Well, so ignoring that particular uh, driver, um, why is it that we're not uh, getting past the compliance stage? And I would argue that, in fact, most of these drivers are in the collective best interest, but not in the individual interest of the scientists. And if we want to make some uh, progress, we have to address their concerns. So I think these were mentioned uh, nicely yesterday. So, so again and again, we hear why scientists can't, won't, shan't uh, um, share. So this was expressed nicely by, uh, by Randall in the 10 reasons not to share and why you should anyway. Um, or the, uh, uh, Chris did an open data excuse bingo that you can play whenever you hear it around your colleagues. You can cross off another bingo square. Um, or I think it was uh, Daniel mentioned yesterday, the 50 shades of no, uh, why you can't share. So how do we get past this stage? Well, I think the, the most important thing is to make the driver the actual process of data-intensive science. If we can make it profitable um, for the uh, individual to, in, uh, to use all of these uh, tools, to use the processes of science, to make them uh, better in the data-intensive age, then we can get past this compliance stage. So how do we do that? So, we go for a, data, for a scientist centric approach. And I think this is simply that we make access um, to the research tools and materials that they actually need. We make them reusable so that the average scientist just uses them day by day because they make his science, her science, more effective. We create the infrastructures for discovery and exchange that uh, Mark was talking about yesterday. And what's more, we make for the scientists themselves easy processes so that they can share their materials um, and make them reusable as well. So basically we foster this uh, feedback and collaboration loop right at the tool stage, right at the science stage, way before the publication happens. So it's a basically a layered or phased approach where we actually address the way that science is done today. And that's in inherently by postdocs. Um, we, uh, we employ lots of postdocs, we unfortunately can't keep many of them because of the uh, the situation of, uh, of rotation that, that has to be in, uh, in our science. So therefore, we have to pass things down from one postdoc to another. And this is a very painful process if the postdoc has locked away all of their stuff in their local drawer, on their local computer, or in the computer they took away with them. So we have to make this layered approach where, where the tools are actually f um, facilitating passing information between colleagues between uh, people in, who inherit uh, an analysis, within the teams that are collectively doing an analysis, which may be geographically distributed. Um, and also, very ex importantly, that we, we help at the exploitation phase, not just later. So we actually have to help with tools that are capable of doing closed access as well as open access. Um, and we accompany the scientists through the whole process, which means that you don't just ask them at the end, give us all the resources that were necessary for this publication, because they genuinely can't find some of them later, if you haven't tracked and helped them all the way along. Um, so we have to keep these, uh, the, these stores of uh, digital resources, as I say, at the close of the exploitation phase as well. So how do we do this? Well, there were several uh, approaches given yesterday, uh, very uh, excellent approaches at the uh, institute level, at the national level, um, the subject level. I'm just gonna briefly, briefly mention the basically the catch-all level, um, something that we've been doing within uh, open air, which was to create uh, Zenodo as a catch-all repository um, to help the, uh, open, the uh, open data pilots of the EC. But it's very similar to the, uh, the fig share that Daniel described, or data dryer, or various other open, uh, open data services. 
Now the critical elements here are, as you see at the top right there, it not only supports open access content, but closed access and embargoed access content. So the researchers really can put them there and start sharing from the, the moment that uh, they, they know that their resource is valuable to their, their colleagues. And only later during the publication stage, which may be months later, they can program through an embargoed uh, opening um, to make it a proper open access. So you get the automatic stamp of the, the DOI to make it citable, shareable. Um, we're working on the richness of the, uh, the metadata uh, within the RDA re working groups. Um, and as Daniel said uh, yes, later, we make it easy to, uh, to get attention. If it isn't uh, impact, it's at least attention um, through all the different sharing uh, mechanisms. And at the bottom, there are the uh, ways to cite this and, uh, and how to export and share this. So all of these uh, have to be collective uh, efforts, and we're doing them through the, uh, through the RDA standardization process, at least the process of agreeing with all of our colleagues on how we might do this better. So I think this makes um, data a usable um, resource for the, uh, for the day to day scientist. But I think the key actually is the software, because without uh, the software, the data is actually unusable. Now, more and more um, scientists are moving over to the way that we do uh, software development in the open source uh, movement. And this is basically through collaborative development, through uh, code sharing repositories like GitHub, SourceForge, or, or Bitbucket. This means that you put your code out there openly, and you have your colleagues contribute to it as well, and your colleagues find the, er the problems in it. Um, you put unit and regression tests there, which means that you're actually hardening your software so you've got more confidence in, in its outputs. Uh, and as I say, more and more scientists are doing this. And in fact, there are great initiatives in the UK, the Software Carpentry, the Software Sustainability Institute, that help scientists to do this better and better. So not just to put in the tests, but to actually to document it. Um, and there are automatic documentation systems as well, which make this easy. But one last element, which I think is very important, is adding this extra layer at the top, um, this sort of 10-minute overview, I think they, uh, they call it, which uh, gives a, a, a descriptive element of what's going on in the logic of the program. Now, this is important if you want it to be shared outside of your immediate team. If you want people to understand that it might be useful to them and, and allow it to be found by them, so you have to put this extra effort in. It's a little bit like the publication stage, but not quite enough. Um, and this allows people outside your field um, to do what we do in the open source uh, movement, which is to contribute to code which you have perhaps no intention of using or an intention of using in a completely different context. Um, so people have to find it, know that it's interesting, think that you've got a good algorithm, and then just take it and improve it. So I think this is going on more and more. Um, but what I would like to see is to be able to leave the code there and actually publish it as part of our standard scientific process so that the, uh, the, the scientists don't have to go through extra hoops um, in a publication process. So for this, I mean that you actually add Instead of just the contributor list, which is uh, an, um, a listing of every single person that added a dot in any part of the code, you actually uh, distill it down into an author list. You can add on the standardized terminologies and ontologies that will allow it to be uh, more searchable and findable. And you can add that little layer, which I said was the most important part of our scientific process, which is the narrative, which actually explains why you did it, how you did it, why other people should take, uh, pay attention to it, uh, and perhaps use it as well. And I believe that these two could be done together by just adding a few extra files on top of um, a collaborative development environment and then snapshotting it and calling it a publication, a, pub a citable object. Then we actually make science much easier because the thing that's most key to the data-driven uh, data age can actually then be trivially shared. So this is what we've been doing um, in Zenodo as well. Um, we've uh, done a tight integration with, uh, with GitHub, such that basically you can just flick a switch. You can log in with the GitHub uh, login, you can flick a switch, and then suddenly all of your repositories are visible, and you can start archiving them. So every time you tag a release, um, it then picks up the information that you put in there, the metadata um, description, so Zenodo.json, picks it out, 
allows you to uh, then, I mean, it automatically submits it uh, as a record into a, a repository, issues a DUI to it, and then you've got a citable object with all of these at extra attributes that make it findable. And as I say, what we're trying to do uh, um, with the collaborators, so with Mozilla Science, with Figshare, with uh, PLOS, with Data One, is to standardize things like those uh, the terminologies, the ontologies, the metadata, such that everyone, whichever uh, repository you use and whichever archiving tool you use, you'll get the same uh, information shared and it will become a, a common resource that can be, uh, can be used and found uh, within the scientific process. Mentioned yesterday the, uh, the importance of sharing your protocols as well, the notebooks uh, if necessary. So um, the IPython notebook is a fantastic uh, example of how to do this uh, well. It allows you to interactively show uh, your, your thought processes and, and the outputs of the, uh, the data analyses. And so uh, people are increasingly now capturing these and putting them in, uh, in the repositories as well. So in uh, Figshare Zenodo here. I liked this one particularly because it's um, a young uh, researcher put his thesis in uh, and then put the IPython notebook and said basically you can now uh, validate the entire thesis by just hitting return here, which is a fantastic step forwards. Um, there are other sites, uh, common sites, there are um, subject specific sites, but there are common sites as well for, for, for sharing. So I think we've got all of the elements there. Um, in generic repositories, in, in the specific repositories, to start to put these things together. And as Mark explained, if we can make them more and more interoperable, um, be speaking the same language, sharing the same things, then we make the hurdles for the, uh, the scientist much, much lower, and they can share literally, at pushing a, a release in, uh, in GitHub, you suddenly uh, share your entire uh, um, output. So now a few comments on, uh, on what we're doing at CERN. So CERN perhaps is a slightly different scale. Um, we do have data, we have a lot of it. We have uh, 100 petabytes, in fact, um, on tape at the moment, and we're taking more at a rapid rate. Um, and we're perhaps known for our open access policies, but we also have uh, open data policies. Uh, not that many people would want to swallow and analyze that, but uh, um, we, we, we want to share as much as we can uh, we, we, we define them in four different levels here. The four different levels for us are the, the top level is the publication data that was discussed yesterday, which uh, absolutely should be uh, shared openly, and we have been doing that for quite some time now. Uh, the next level down for us is the data sets that you prepare specifically for, uh, for specific purposes, like outreach or education purposes, which again should be shared as widely as possible. The next level down is actually the, uh, what we call the analysis object data, the, the data which you can properly do an analysis on, uh, and this is big data. But it's not the final level, the level four, which is the raw data, the measurement data itself, for which um, you, you need a huge amount of software and um, years of training to actually understand and to utilize properly. So even within uh, CERN, we restrict access to that um, because it's to the strictly to the few that are actually going to do the processing, which takes months and months of processing to produce the analysis uh, data that everybody else can use. So we do that in a very controlled manner, not to, uh, to waste resources. But the rest of it, we're trying to open as much as we can um, in, in the most efficient way as possible. So the problem for us is slightly different to um, to capturing it in, say, uh, uh, an IPython Python notebook. Because there are so many different actors involved and such a long process. So analyses might take three, five years and they might involve hundreds of people. And it's a multi-step process whereby, as I say, you go from the raw data, you do the, re um, you do the uh, reconstruction into the analysis objects. You then do various different selections, skimming, thin thinning, slimming, different operations uh, on the data to produce different uh, subsets which then go through analysis chains of different groups of people, say 50 people at a time, which then produce uh, reduced data sets, which we call intervals, which then go on to the final analysis. So it's a massive enterprise and to capture that, um, we had to think uh, again about, uh, about the process and how we make uh, open science in this, uh, in this environment. Because people are actually, so many people are involved that they're sharing their code on Git, on local subversions, on GitHub, various different places. 
they're discussing their uh, their analyses on on Twickies and SharePoints and uh, and different places. They're putting their analyses as well as in code repositories. They're putting them on local uh, on local disks and shared file systems, and they're discussing the essences of them in various different um, uh, internal document stores. So how to capture all of that such that it's usable um, in the future. So what we uh, have been putting together is something that we call the Data Analysis Preservation Portal, which attempts to capture the workflow, the code, the statistical models, and the documentation in a manner that's understandable, palatable, and publishable. So what we're doing um, is with each experiment, we're trying to break down their analysis chains into understandable units. So uh, here you can see the, uh, the basic information, the, the physics information, then the what, was ha what happened at each of the analysis stage, the analysis ob object creation stage, the uh, specific analysis stage. And for each one, we can open up and ask certain questions, certain questions that look like standard librarian questions, but also questions that look at, at the software versions, the, uh, the virtual environments that were being used. Um, and most importantly, we ask where this stuff is. So we don't ask them to immediately uh, take it out of the environment and, uh, and uh, give it to us. We ask them where it is, give us a link to it, and then we either give an offer to, uh, to keep it as a link or to harvest it. So the, the process itself can be iterative. As you build up your analysis, you fill in each of these stages, you say where, say where all of the, uh, the information is stored, and, very, and gradually over the years, it's all gathered together. And at one point, you can then push uh, return, and it can go and harvest all of these different things, pull it together, and then you've got all of the analysis uh, ready for, uh, for the publication step. So we actually ask more step questions than that. The questions involve it, um, a higher level view of the, what statistical analyses we use, what models we used, um, what were the physics objects being, uh, um, being operated on. These allow findability. So a new postdoc that comes along in five years' time can do a search and say, which analyses were done in this collaboration which involved these final states that I'm interested in looking at, these particles, or, or using that statistical model. And then they can go down and then they'll be able to go further on to the code and find, uh, find that code. All of this being in a closed environment within a collaboration, albeit a, a worldwide collaboration, so that the, the, the trust and the human aspects of, of trying or failing uh, can all go on um, behind the closed doors of the collaboration before the sharing stage. So what happens at the sharing stage? So between that and the next uh, step, um, there must be a publication. So our, what we want to do is help our publication committees actually take all of that information, so the internal publication committees, uh, because with 3,000 authors, we actually do a lot of the process ourselves before it even gets out to a journal. Um, and we want to present to those publication committees all of that information, including virtual environments where they can rerun the, the code that's being uh, discussed in the paper. But then distilling that information will become so much easier and putting on to the publication uh, stage will be so much easier. So what we've done is, uh, is a separate initiative is put at the end of it something called our Open Data Portal which takes a fraction of that and we're trying to explore what it is to put out some of CERN's data, um, what it is to describe it, what metadata is needed, what tools are needed to make it usable by other people. And we've split it into what I described before, the level 2 data and the level 3 data, because uh, the level 1 data is already with the publishers. Um, and we're trying to, uh, we put this out in November to explore what, uh, what the possibilities are for actually sharing with this with society. So a little note there, we only put out 40 terabytes because, as I say, there's an exploitation phase for our data and we put out the earliest data sets, so not the ones that we've taken in the last couple of uh, years, which add up to the petabytes, but the ones that were in 2010, the first data sets, and we'll progressively open up all the rest afterwards. So on the outreach and uh, education side, we put in uh, in-browser tools that allow you to interact with the data, to understand what, a, what an event collision is, to, to try and explore our science more, to get people to appreciate what's going on um, in the, uh, the science at CERN. And also uh, tools to interact with the data, to allow you to do interactive cuts, histogramming, um, to, to get a feel for the data as well. On the level three side, so uh, we actually put out the entire analysis object data, 
and virtual machines that are used by our physicists. So as I say, the stuff that we captured along the way, and we allow other people to download it and run it, if they should show, show desire. So this is thousands, millions of lines of code, um, and the complete analysis environment that actually a physicist at CERN would be using. Now you might ask, would you really want to uh, hunt for dark ma matter on your sofa, as the uh, headline said? Well, yes, people are interested, amazingly. Um, to do all of that effort of downloading terabytes of data and to understand the complexities of our virtual machines. Another thing we tried, which was slightly different, um, but very interesting, uh, was to put out some of the data, along with some of the code, that we used to actually find the Higgs in 2012, which led to the, uh, to the latest Nobel Prize for uh, Peter Higgs. So in that analysis for the tau jets that you see uh, spraying out at the bottom there, we actually used some machine learning techniques. So we put out on Kaggle, which is um, a basically a data scientist exchange point uh, where they test each other and challenge each other. We put out our challenge, which is here's our data, here's our machine learning algorithm. Can anyone do any better? Um, and amazingly, we got 1,785 entries from scientists around the world or, or uh, um, people who are experts in machine learning and have nothing to do with particle physics that were interested in trying to do better than us in finding the Higgs. So this was fantastic. And in fact, in the end, the, the algorithm that won did was a, a better efficient uh, finder of Higgses than the one that we'd been using. So we invited the, uh, the uh, scientists uh, to come along to CERN to actually explain uh, their techniques to us. So I think sharing, even sharing massive data sets, sharing massively complicated programs can be beneficial to your own science. And, and this is us showing how we did it. On the open data side, I just show a few of the, uh, the challenges we were facing there in how to describe it, how to describe the, uh, the, the complexity of the data, this narrative and the, uh, the additional uh, terminology that you put on top of uh, the data in the data portals. So as I say, people were interested, yeah, amazingly. Um, on launch day, there were people, I think it was 15 gigabytes per second was, no, per hour, sorry, was being downloaded of our data continuously. After a few weeks, it had gone down to only four gigabytes per hour. But it, today, still, people are desperately trying to download the LHC data. Um, and they're, they're accessing the, uh, the event displays, the histogramming packages, and we're making new connections. So it really does work that uh, you think that particle physics, we must know all the people interested in particle physics in our community already. Well, we're, we're making new connections of people who actually perhaps worked with us in the past or peripherally did, went on to other uh, domains, and now want to get back in contact to get the data and use it in a, a other different ways. So uh, even massive data, as I say, can be used in unexpected ways. And I think uh, Keith uh, mentioned this yesterday. Some of the people that are downloading our data, we've asked them what they're doing, and they're just simply using it as a statistical analysis set. So it's nothing to do with particle physics. Uh, they just want to do something interesting with a, with a diverse set of data. Other people are doing machine learning on things that are nothing to do with our algorithms, again, for their own algorithms. So even our data, which you might, might think is completely closed to ourselves, seems to be interesting to other people. So, in conclusion, I, uh, I use the words of one of our first presidents of council. Scientific research lives and flourishes in an atmosphere of freedom. Freedom to doubt, freedom to inquire, and freedom to discover. And our processes are made to encourage that freedom, to encourage the, uh, the feedback loops. Um, so basically, I conclude that we must ensure that all of our data-driven processes also preserve those freedoms. They are, they are iterative. They allow false leads to happen. You share enough that curiosity of other people can, uh, can help you. And basically, we ensure that those shoulders uh, of the past, of our current past, are actually there for our future to stand on. So basically, my message is that if we put the scientists first and we improve this scientific process, I really think we can then reap the benefits for society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, any questions? Hello, uh, thanks for
interesting presentation. I was wondering how many of the workflows that you showed there are like mandatory and forced, and uh, or is this like kind of a offer for the new postdoc? Is what you can do? Yeah. So the, the capture we're doing is not enforced at all. What we've tried to do is break it down into sections that we see are genuinely. Gen generally used by the experiments, but we're not enforcing those steps. And they can invent new ones and we'll just add them to the, uh, to the process. And again, you can skip steps, you can not fill in all the information. Um, so it's basically, it's a tool to help them, it's not a tool to police them. But it's, uh, so normally people use it or...? No, so we're just creating these things at the moment. Oh, okay. um, so it's, I, I put demo there because it really is a prototype that we're going through at the moment since the beginning of this year. We first put out the open data portal to experience for ourselves what it is to share massive data. And then, we, and then in doing that, we realized by talking to the, some of the active physicists that the stuff that we were asking for to be published in the open data portal, they didn't have their hands on anymore. Even though they're still at CERN, they're still in science, they're still on the same analysis, but it was something that was used five years ago and had changed since then. So therefore, we realized that we had to help the scientists on the stage before the open data portal. And, and that's what we've been doing in the last six months. Okay, any more questions? Interesting, as usual. The question is the following. Um, assuming that uh, we, we would all start sharing data sets and experiments and software and uh, be able to identify them or to link them to a paper. There is still something missing right in the picture and I think it's uh, the notion of uh, the activity that included all these things in one experiment. Right? So, for example, the same software with different configurations can be used different inputs and serve different papers, right? Uh, what you're basically suggesting, actually the world is suggesting, not just you, is a, is a pairwise combination of these objects, right? They're never combined together in a context, which is actually the thing that is missing. So, so what's your position? Uh, Thanks for asking, that. because it was an element I didn't touch on, which is basically, when I said the layered approach, I think if we can get the software in its context to be understandable, and its data in its context to be understandable, then the publication is a layer on top, which basically says, um, as you say, this is the context of my experiment, and I use this software, which is snapshotted there and I use that data which is snapshotted there, but I no longer have to describe it in detail, why it uh, was used, how it was used, what it does, in the paper, and try and make the paper too big. I can just layer onto, and the person that's interested just clicks down into and gets the explanation for that software and the snapshot that was used for that paper. So basically, um, it's, a, in a, it's an assemblage of all the different elements that you used, which are left where they're best shared and, uh, and exploited, and then you just put the narrative, the very thin narrative of the context on top, and all these other pieces um, are linked to because they're reliably shared, uh, stored somewhere else. Okay. Okay, I see no more questions, so thank you once again.